So with respect to social uh, meditation and trauma informedness, I, I wanted to share that you know the way that I think about this is that social meditation is a collection of uh, facilitated peer-to-peer -peer protocols, instruction sets for how to practice together. And um, already in the way that it's structured in this peer-to-peer -peer format where there's a facilitator and the facilitator is quite important. And the facilitator might also be holding a teacher hat as well, um, but doesn't have to be. Um, the facilitator could be anyone who maybe just read about this and wants to try it with a couple friends. Um, the instructions are such that um, the facilitator's role is really to to kind of make sure everyone understands the instructions and to to kind of execute the protocol in a way, if you want to think of it in geeky terms. Um, and, and already right there built into the form, this is a different form of meditation than guided practice because guided meditation is one to many. You know, the, the person who's guiding the meditation, um, it's very, very important that they, um, that they cover some of, the, some of the basic things that we've talked about, including giving people permission to not do the practice or to not follow the instructions. Um, and, and in a way, it's a little bit harder, I'd say, guiding a meditation and to, to kind of cue into or notice when people are struggling because we don't hear from them, uh, except maybe at the end if there's a chance for questions or discussion, and maybe not even then because people can often be silent. Um, whereas in social meditation, the very form of it where everyone is practicing out loud together, um, in some ways, it, it kind of already lends itself a little bit to, to being a bit more trauma informed, and where the 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 one to many, which includes often a kind of vertical relationship, is a little bit more flat and a more of a peer to peer network. Um, so so that can actually reduce triggers right there um, for folks that may have some trauma or wounding, especially around uh, authority figures. Um, the facilitators, I think, a little less threatening as a role than perhaps the teacher can be when they're guiding a meditation. Um, depends, but I wanted to start there. And I also want to just talk about some of the elements of social meditation that have been, I think, trauma are trauma-informed parts of the protocol that are important because they, in a sense, arose out of, uh, over time, seeing the way that people could be triggered doing social meditation practice. I mean, it is actually also a very triggering, potentially triggering practice in that it involves being social. And anytime people are social, it tends to bring up stuff, um, social conditioning. Um, so in that sense, maybe uh, guided meditation is a little easier, actually, um, because you're not having to deal so explicitly with those interpersonal dynamics uh, as much. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to almost share this as a chronology of the development of social meditation as I've seen it, starting with the elements that have been there from the beginning and then sharing a bit about those that have emerged uh, over time and how and why they emerged. Uh, and then talk a little bit about what's coming up in terms of another another update to the social meditation uh, approach that that is in line with this trauma informed meditation teaching. So um, so in the beginning, when when Kenneth started to translate social noting into out loud uh, the out loud form, uh, to, I'm sorry, rather mental noting into social noting. Um, he very quickly had to deal with this with the trauma trauma related to interpersonal stuff. And one of the things that he did is always up front at the beginning of a of an event or a workshop or a session. He always told people, "You're welcome to leave at any point. You don't have to to continue to st sit through this or stay here. You, you're it's you, he, he reminded people that uh, or he he in, invited people to to leave and said it's okay. He tried to normalize that. Um, I think this was a kind of a first attempt at, at, at working with the possibility that these practices and, and the reality that these practices will bring stuff up for people. Um, and then another thing that I think is a part of the protocol that's trauma informed um, from the very beginning was this uh, instruction of what he called the safety release valve. Um, and that it, it started with social noting where it, at any point, if you don't know what to say, in the practice, you can always say pass or don't know or uncertain or some variation on that theme. Now we've added thank you, which seems to work well, especially doing social meta practices. That's been a recent addition over the course of the last six months. And um, this really, in some sense, uh, works with the 
the possible pressure that can build up in a social situation where you feel like you're compelled to have to say something and then might not know what to say or might feel like I'm not sure what to say and I got to come up with something anyway. And that can kind of snowball for some people, um, particularly if they have a history of social anxiety or they, you know, this, this is a challenging environment for them to be in. So the safety release valve just lets some of that pressure off, you know, gives people a place to go when they don't know what to do. Um, so I think that's very, a very trauma-informed move that Kenneth came up with. And although this seems kind of mundane and simple, I mean, just the very part of the protocol where we ask if there are any questions about the practice, I think is also an important part of the trauma-informed orientation because um, it is actually the case that in many uh, communities, people are given instructions and then they're just expected to do the thing without having or without being able to air or express any questions. I think maybe for some of us, we might take that for granted because we've spent more time in environments that are aware and sensitive to giving people a voice and letting people ask questions. Um, but you may have that experience as well as I have where you go into a more of a traditional environment and, and it's not expected that you ask questions, it's expected you do the practice and do it how, how it's being told. Um, that's more of a, of, of a traditional Dharma approach in, in some places. Um, so, so making sure that everyone has a chance to ask questions uh, about the practice is an important part of, uh, of making sure that if something's coming up for people, they can say something. Um, in the beginning, uh, Kenneth would often do social practice in two-player uh, mode. Um, and that's something that I've, uh, I really try to avoid for the most part, except in certain circumstances. Um, and, and, and the reason for this is very much, ex it's very much based on experience. Uh, I was teaching a pragmatic Dharma uh, course in, in Los Angeles uh, in 2011. I was living there and studying with Trudy Goodman. And, um, and I introduced social noting as part of that training. And I was doing what I knew at the time, which was the uh, ping pong noting, as Kenneth called it, two-player mode, where you're just going back and forth, back and forth. And although uh, it was in a group of people who were all in the same room together, uh, it wasn't that they were isolated in little you know, booths by themselves, it was still the case that uh, something kind of intense came up in one of the, one of the dyads. And um, there was a, 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 a woman and a man who were paired together and uh, that experience triggered a lot of things for her. Um, it seemed likely to do with sexual trauma. And she heard some notes that, that her partner was using that um, she interpreted as being potentially sexual in nature and she felt uh, kind of a boundary violation in, in the noting. And it brought up concerns for us, of course. You know, we don't want to create an environment where someone is like creeping out, creeping out someone else and making them feel uncomfortable. Um, but we also didn't know if that was actually the intention. Uh, we knew that that was the impact of the practice, but we didn't know where the guy was coming from. So, so we went through a whole process consulting with Trudy on this, and I ended up, uh, she ended up speaking to him. We, we knew a little bit other teachers who knew his practice. We talked to him, and, and we realized it, it, it almost certainly wasn't the case that that's where he was coming from. It was an innocent thing, but it still brought that up. And so part of how I started to adjust how I teach social meditation, just to kind of avoid that situation really, is working in groups of three or more. And what that does is it provides an extra perspective, an extra person uh, in the group so that there's less of a chance of that kind of hyper intimacy that could go off the rails. There's, there's someone there that to kind of keep us in check and also maybe maybe that just changes how we perceive how, how we're, our words and how they're landing with each other. And I found that since that time, and that's 10 years ago now, uh, that, that issue hasn't really arisen again in, this, in, this, in the same way. Um, and so I think it really works well to have three or more people uh, in, a, in small groups together. And, and so unless it's a very particular form of practice or in a group like this where we have a lot of experience with each other, and we want to do something that really would be benefited by the two-player mode. I tend to avoid that for that reason. And then recently, a couple of years ago, we were on a, a in-person retreat. I was with Kenneth again. Um, some of you, I think, were probably there. And um, we were doing a week of pragmatic Dharma retreat. And um, I was introducing 
more social meditation practices. And it was, a, it was a group in which some people were really interested and down, and then other people weren't as interested in the social practices. In fact, it brought stuff up for them and they felt unsafe. And so uh, because we were on retreat, I mean, for sure people could leave if they wanted, but we wanted to find some way where it wasn't just like either leave or, or not, you know, which can bring up other stuff. Like you have to, I have to leave. I'm an outcast. You know, I can't be part of this. Um, or like for me in yoga class, I remember people saying, you know, the teachers would always say, I suck at yoga. So they'd be like, oh, if it's uncomfortable, if the position doesn't work for you, you can always go into this other position. And I'm like, I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be the one person who's like going into this, like into child's pose while everyone else is in downward dog. So there's social pressure, you know, to, 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 to participate. And I, and I get, that's a real thing. So what we, what we came up with in response to that, uh, was the witness, the role of the witness. And we said, okay, if anyone would like to witness the practice to be an observer, you can go, uh, we have a circle of chairs here and anyone can go over here. They've got a little, uh, a witness section set up here. You can go sit and just witness. And Kenneth went and witnessed. He wanted to witness some of the practices. He didn't feel comfortable doing some of them, which surprised me. But I was like, oh, cool. Well, that's that makes sense. You you like social noting, but don't like this other thing. That's fair. And uh, other people took advantage of that. And then from, from that point on, it became baked into the protocol, You know, a, an opportunity in every practice for people to be able to participate as a silent observer. And, and really, a lot of folks do for various reasons. Um, one, if they don't feel safe or they don't know the technique, or maybe they've just got like a dog in the background barking or they're on, you know, in a taxi or, you know, they're just feeling silent. doesn't matter what the reasons are. Um, it's an important part of the, of the protocol now and how we teach uh, social meditation. Um, another way that I found that this practice and this protocol can be trauma informed, and this is more of a move that the facilitator needs to make themselves is if they, if they do have anyone in the group that they have some concerns about and say they're sending people into breakout rooms, they, you know, as a facilitator, you can choose to go in the room with someone. You can choose to actually put yourself in a position where you're, where you're present with someone who you, who you think might be, you know, potentially have uh, something coming up for them or potentially could have some issues based on, you know, however you know that or, or however you'd sense that. Um, and I found that to be quite helpful. You know, that way you can... You can be there, you can be present, you can be a steadying uh, presence. And, um, you know, and you can learn more about what's going on for someone and just get a better sense of things. So that's, that's another way that, that facilitating these practices can be trauma-informed. And then outside of the practice, when we do a debrief, um, when we either a quick one where you're just getting a couple words on how things went, or a more extended debrief where people can share more, ask questions. That's an opportunity to really see how it went for people and to get actual data, you know, on how it went. And, and I think there, there's an opportunity. If you've noticed someone has really um, gotten triggered, if they've said something or they're having really extreme intense emotions or crying a lot, which is not necessarily a problem, but you know, it can be an indicator sometimes that someone, uh, someone's uh, looping in a, in a trauma pattern. Um, they get really angry, you know, and have an outburst, whatever it is, you know, you, we, we can follow up with that person actually, you know, we get that data about how it went and then we actually could follow up. And I've done this many times where I'll just follow up with someone and say, Hey, you know, just want to make sure you're, you know, you can, you're welcome to reach out if you have any questions or, um, just want to make, you know, I, I noticed X just want to see if there's anything you wanted to talk about, just make myself available essentially. Um, and, and that can be, I think, another way that, that this practice and facilitating social meditation can be, um, you know, we, we can just kind of follow up and, and care for people, you know, and, and it's not that this happens a lot or all the time. It's just that it does come up. And when it comes up, it's, it's good to, especially in a teaching role, it's really good to follow up with folks and see if they need anything um, and see if there's anything we can do for them. And then the last thing I want to mention, which is kind of, um, it's been a recent development and it's more, it's going to be kind of more um, explicit in the, the 2.0 version of the social meditation guide. So right now we're on 1.0, working on 1.5, adding a bunch of new practices. And then also at the same time, working on um, being able to vi visually I I uh, identify the name of the practice, um, a little bit of like 
know, which ways of meditation does this particular technique touch on of the six ways? Uh, and then also importantly, what is the difficulty level of this practice using a really simple schema here of basic, intermediate, and advanced? Um, and I think it's really important how the, how the social meditation guide is organized is, is based on the schema, basic techniques, intermediate techniques, advanced techniques. And, and what makes something basic, intermediate, advanced is a little, I'm not going to go into depth on this. Um, I did do a, share a talk recently called Gratitude Drop and Complex Practices that does go into this a bit more. Um, but basically the complexity of the practice plus, plus the challenge level of the practice equals the difficulty. So complexity plus challenge is difficulty. And the complexity just refers to how complex the instructions are. You know, is it something simple like there is noting, there's seeing, there's thinking? That's extremely simple in terms of complexity. Um, or you could have something like, you know, essence release noting, where you're taking the essence noting and you're bringing it through a progressive release. That's really complex. You got to know a bunch of moving pieces and instructions and it's nested and then there's a sequence and so forth. Uh, so that combined with the challenge level of a practice, and, and the reason I, I want to differentiate this is that some practices are really simple complexity-wise, but they're really challenging for many people, like social tonglen. Uh, and this, this is one that I think it's so simple. It's a really simple practice. Um, essentially, all you're doing is on the, at the end of the out-breath, you're saying suffering, breathing in suffering. At the top of the in-breath, you're saying love and breathing out love. I mean, it's not that complicated of a practice, but it tends to bring up a lot of stuff for people and tends to be difficult um, for folks. Uh, and I've seen this time and again. And so um, that is a practice that I would say it's an advanced practice, but it's not because of how complex the instructions are. It's because of how difficult it, the technique can be for people. Um, and, and identifying the uh, difficulty level of a practice gives people some information up front in terms of how of how they want to engage with a practice um, because anyone can be a witness we don't restrict practices in the buddhist geeks network so and i wouldn't recommend necessarily restricting practices either um, uh, meaning anyone can join any practice even if it's an advanced practice but they, they may want to know that it's an advanced practice. Uh, having that information up front is really helpful. So we're trying in the 2.0 version of the guide to have a, a real simple visual indicator of that with every technique, just to make sure it's ultra clear, you know, that you're, you're getting into an advanced practice or this is a basic practice and so forth. Uh, and I think that's another way that, that this, these, these techniques can be um, trauma informed. Um, because you know, if it's an advanced practice, it might be it might be pretty difficult. You know, it might bring more stuff up.